I'm a little bit biased towards these vehicles. I've been in the cab trade now for over 20 years, and I suppose if you cut me open, I'd have a FX4 inside me. Everything we've ever had on the FX4 has been a compromise to fit in, uh, but never designed specifically. Except, of course, the, where the water comes in over the right foot when it rains. Any part of the cab, no matter what you hit, you can replace it, whether it's a back wing, door, boot lid, they're all replaceable. For more than 30 years, London's black cab has been made in the same way, in the same place, by the same company. It's a relic from the days when bodies and chassis of cars were built separately and put together by hand. Every country in the world really is quite jealous of it, like, you know. And, uh, it's a one-off product. There'll never be one like it again. Taxi! That's a cry that's known in every city of the world. Have you ever wondered what lies behind the reliability of, say, a London taxi? From the earliest days of motorised taxis, two companies dominated the taxi trade. Austin, the manufacturer, and Mann and Overton, the supplier. Mann and Overton had been formed by my grandfather in 1899, and he'd been importing motor cars in those days uh, from all over Europe. The motor car at 300 pounds uh, was the equivalent value of a, uh, a fairly large house. So uh, the general members of the public found it difficult to afford the price of a motor car. So if you were looking uh, to develop the sales of motor vehicles, what better industry to look at than the taxi market? In 1928, when Mann and Overton wanted a British taxi, they approached Austin to make the chassis. My great uncle Will uh, went up to see Herbert Austin and, uh, in, to start with, was refused permission to see him. So he simply sat down and waited. In the end, Herbert Austin relented and allowed him to go in to see him. And Will said to him, look, I'm very serious about this. We're talking about an order for 500 chassis. Uh, at which point Herbert Austin then uh, took him seriously. And that's really how the, how the relationship with Austin started. The partnership lasted over half a century. By the 1950s, 80% of London's taxis were Austin FX3s. Austin's publicity made great claims for their products. I would like to say that I'm a very satisfied and enthusiastic owner-driver. On occasions, passengers have pulled me out from the middle of the rank because they know that the Austin cab is fast and comfortable and smart. I find that people prefer the Austin taxi. By the late 50s, Mann and Overton wanted to replace the FX3. Austin came up with various designs, but the people who really control London taxi design are the Metropolitan Police Public Carriage Office. Their conditions of fitness have dictated the shape and size of cabs since 1869. The conditions of fitness um, always have to be taken into account when anybody's designing a taxi because in particular they describe the size and, and layout of the passenger compartment. So the rear box, if you like, that the passenger sits in uh, will of necessity always be that, ty that type of uh, size. Rules like these mean that a London taxi must be tailor-made a deterrent to other car manufacturers. The vehicle must be capable of being turned on either lock so as to proceed in the opposite direction without traversing between two parallel... In plain English, this means a turning circle which is six feet less than the average car can achieve and allows taxis to make their enviable U-turns. What it gives us a turning circle is the simple fact that the steering box is so designed from lock to lock to give us more movement on the drop arm with the increase of, tr of track rod length. The drop arm being this part here, which operates from direct from the steering box. Uh, it 
it gives an excess turn on one side and then the other side. We're talking an excess, uh, approximately turn a 25 foot in a turning circle. Is it a particularly clever design? Pardon? Is it a particularly clever design? Uh, no. In 1958, a new taxi which fulfilled all the conditions of fitness was launched at Earl's Court. It was called the FX4. I've grown up uh, with the FX4. It's been part of my life and uh, it's been a, a, an amazing success story. Since 1958, nearly 80,000 FX4s have been made. In their lifetime, each one can average one million miles and is likely to have its doors slammed 100,000 times. While other car designs have come and gone, the FX4 has lived on. My theory is that the vehicle has lasted so long, not only because the way it's made, it's because it, I believe, gives pleasure to the eye. Um, I've always sort of maintained that the round shape of the vehicle, you've got on the back here, on the wings here, is pleasing to the eye. And I, I ask myself the question, why? And I believe it has a lot to do with how your eye contact to the vehicle. Um, if something's square, it's obtrusive, it's, it's hitting you, whereas a round type of vehicle, you can warm to it. Taxi! What I like about London cabs most of all is the comfort and the space. Whether you have an attaché case or whether you have three attaché cases, whether you wear the proverbial top hat for the once-in-your-life uh, visit to Buckingham Palace, you don't have to worry about being crowded. I have worked in about a dozen countries around the world in, in the last 30 years, and I have to say without exaggeration that the London taxi drivers are the politest that I've ever come across and the most helpful. And particularly if you'd love to uh, uh, talk with people, as, as you can tell I do, that you can strike up a great conversation. I don't think that the London uh, cab drivers um, would have any difficulty surpassing New York taxi drivers in terms of the knowledge. Um, New York Taxi drivers frequently do not know where even major hotels are. That's been my unfortunate, bitter experience. I don't think uh, they have in New York um, as frequent or as rigid uh, an MOT uh, testing system that you have in London. And finally, the taxis here are so clean. I, I mean, I, I don't think you have to worry about your wife um, coming in and getting her dress dirty. They are kept, I would say, virtually spotless. This vehicle in particular was involved in a major road accident on, in Kent. Um, the vehicle was, in fact, had just had a new engine put in it and the driver was carefully going on his way home when a Volvo pushed it off the road into a ditch. Um, as you can see from the damage sustained, although the vehicle has been mightily hit because it finished up on the roof, on its roof, you can see from this area that the engine did not get a direct hit. The structure, being a box-type chassis, has prevented the front finishing up into the window screen. In this instance, although the roof took a mighty tumble, the driver was able to walk away from the accident, bruised, battered, and a bit of his pride gone. But thank God he was able to walk away from the accident. Once a year, all cabs must be returned to the public carriage office for a rigorous inspection. Talk about the third degree, why that ain't nothing. They test everything here. The cab, the driver, the lot. If the cab's no good, it's at him. If the driver's no good, he's at him. And what's more, you've got to go back every year to make sure you ain't lost the steering wheel. <laughs> well, Fred, it's all for the good of the public. Yes, I suppose so. Anyway. I passed, and the old cab, she passed. 
Over that way, that's it, lovely. Straighten up. Right, full lock on the right hand, please. any breaks or corrosions, leakages obviously, but mostly corrosion and any pipe that might be foul in any part of the chassis on that side, follow them right the way down to the brain brake actuator, onto the master cylinder, check the master cylinder is all locked and secured, the pedals operate up and down, can you press your brake pedal up and down please? Okay now your clutch pedal please. Okay, there you go. Only if it passes will it get a new license plate. But the checks and inspections don't stop there. Out on the street, public carriage officers like Nigel Weatherall may swoop at any time. Morning, sir. Carriage office. Everything all right? Yeah, no problem. I Sealing the gearbox. I hope there is. Who's doing this then? The BBC? Yep. Just going to have a quick look under the bonnet, okay, sir, OK? It's a nasty creek, isn't it? Got something wrong there, haven't we? Yeah, one of your fulcrum bushes is turning in the wishbone eye. Sorry. One of the fulcrum bushes is turning in the wishbone eye. See that? Well, I don't know much about it. I have all my work done. Well, what, the what that means is it seized up through lack of lubrication. So your front suspension is in a difficult situation. Is it? Yeah. I'll take it down to Derek McRoy. Yeah. yeah. The radiator's loose on the chassis there, look. Sorry? The radiator's loose on the chassis, look. See that? Oh, not there. That's a new radiator, is it? Well, well yeah. I say new radiator, it's less than a year old. Yeah, it's in a bit of a state, isn't it, really? What do you do? <laughs> Brand new one. I wanted to get a recondition. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to put the vehicle on unfit for this suspension. So what does that mean? That means that you'll be receiving an unfit notice from us. Have the cab checked over before you bring it up to us, because we're... I'll carry on work of the day, though. Well, yeah, technically you can, but my advice to you would be to go straight to your garage and get this checked out first. Well, are you going to give me a note to tell me what to do, then? No, I'll tell you what to do when I've taken the particulars. Okay. Time off the streets is money lost, so a whole subculture has grown up to keep the cabs moving. Beneath St Pancras Station, in what were once wine cellars, is a car wash that will clean your cab inside and out in eight minutes. According to carriage office rules, if a driver conveys a person with a notifiable disease, such as cholera, anthrax or plague, they must have their taxi disinfected and can charge the passengers accordingly. The public carriage office controls the drivers as well as the taxis. Since 1853, cabbies have had to pass a knowledge of London test. This is where a man makes his first inquiries about becoming a taxi driver 
And here he learns, rather to his surprise, that being an expert driver isn't nearly enough. He's got to have a knowledge of London which will enable him to know instantly the best route to any part of the capital. Our last slide, we finished at Victoria Station. We proceed along Victoria Street, on the left-hand side, Buckingham Gate. On the right, the Army Navy stores. Further along on the left, we get Caxton Hall. We turn over to the right of Parliament Square, where we find Westminster Abbey. Continue the square on the left corner of our Parliament Street, we get the Ministry of Health. Ford Addison Bridge, Ford Hammersmith Road, right in the Brook Green. How about the other way? The other way is leaving the right. Um, Bayswater Road, Ford Knott Mill Gate, Ford Island Park Avenue. You're talking about going through the other way. Holland Circus, carry on. Yeah, Holland Circus, Shepherd's Bush Green, Shepherd's Bush Road, left in the Brook Green. That's it. And there's the other one you go through. Oh, really? <laughs> 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 Westminster Bridge, Ford Westminster Bridge, Westminster Bridge Road, Westminster Road to St George's Circus, lead by Borough Road, left Borough Ash Street, right Newcomer Street, left Great Maze Pond. That's it, that's better. Spot on the robot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Most of the men who attend this and similar schools have to learn about London in their spare time. It may take as long as nine months, and quite a lot of them give up in despair. But many do go on and master the details of the hundreds of routes with which they have to be familiar. third generation of my family to be associated with the London cab trade and I think this is a diabolical liberty. In 1961, three years after the launch of the FX4, a new threat to the black cab appeared. I think my father saw the arrival of minicabs as a very serious threat. It was the only time that I remember of my life, uh, my father being really frightened. Um, the impact of the minicab was, was so dramatic. Um, and. Uh, he, I think, really could see uh, a, a serious danger to, uh, to the end of the purpose-built taxi. Minicabs couldn't be flagged down, but with radios, they were one up on the black cabs. So the black cabs quickly adopted radios, and the two learned to live with each other. I don't know uh, what you mean by minicab, if you mean uh, one half the size of this. Uh, if you're talking about, however, a mini-taxi, uh, this is what the, these guys uh, claim to be. Uh, that's a different thing. But um, I don't recognise the fact that they really exist, they, and legally they don't. Other firms try to take on the FX4. The Winchester, I don't think, was terribly successful uh, for a number of reasons. They didn't have the buying power to get the quality of product uh, in terms of chassis components and other things uh, that are so important. Um, the taxi trade wants to use a vehicle that it feels confident about getting spares and repairs done easily. None of the competitors survived. The FX4 had a monopoly. In 1982, Austin, now British Leyland, handed over the FX4 to the company that had been making bodies for the cab. Car Bodies of Coventry had been building just that, car bodies, since 1919. Now, for the first time, they started to make a whole vehicle. The FX4 was starting to show its age. Car bodies couldn't afford to develop a brand new design, so they looked for one already in production that they could adapt. Car bodies felt there might be an opportunity to build a new body shape using an existing vehicle body and therefore avoiding huge to tooling costs. It was based on the Range Rover and uh, Land Rover at the time were fairly keen to be helpful and uh, allow this body shape to be to be used. But when new regulations required London taxis to provide wheelchair access, the new CR6 design was more difficult and more expensive to adapt than the old FX4. 
it was the end of the road for the CR6. Car bodies stuck with the old faithful, with its old problems. I particularly had dreadful problems, although oh, I'm a big man, but I'm only six foot two and a half, which isn't exceptional. And uh, I always had to jack the seat down as low as it would go. And even then, my head still brushed the top roof. And on a hot day, it was like driving around with a frying pan on your head, a hot frying pan on your head. And of course, with, the, uh, with one's knees, they were still jacked up in this sort of position. And you were your, your body was forward, so you got this gap behind you. And this meant, of course, that you developed back trouble very, very soon. The other thing, of course, was that the steering wheel would cut across the, your trousers and make a, a shiny mark. The day I bought this cab, I had water coming in from the roof. I had water coming in through the windscreen. I had to have a new roof put on. I had to have new linings put, or new insulation put around the windows. The other thing about the FX4, of course, is the windscreen just was not deep enough. The roof level came across and then stopped about there, which meant that one was looking, if one was sitting with the head up, was looking through that sort of top inch of the windscreen. And the windscreen wipers would wipe all the windscreen except the piece that you were looking through. And so uh, this caused not only uh, back strain, um, knee contortion, and also eye strain as well, because uh, you, just, uh, you just couldn't drive for very long periods. In 1987, serious competition for the FX4 appeared in the form of the new Metro Cab. Whichever way you look at it, the Metro Cab sets higher standards for taxi vehicles. There is nothing to touch it. One of the main reasons I bought the Metro as opposed to the FX4 was the amount of visibility in the cab. Um, if you were to superimpose the, the windscreen of an FX4 on the Metro, it would come to about here somewhere. I found it affected my driving position. I'd sit down and crouch up in order to see where I was going. But here I could sit up very comfortable in a nice position, and it means at the end of the day that I'm not, uh, I'm not that tired. The future undoubtedly lies with a vehicle of this shape. I, I think that um, the FX4 is, is an old-fashioned vehicle. It, it is not um, a vehicle of the modern times. The doors open the wrong way. The shape is bulky. It, uh, it leaks. It's windy. Um, whereas there are one or two problems with the Metro, but whenever a problem has occurred, the manufacturers have, have changed, got it right, and they're moving ahead with the times. Whereas the FX4 is limited by its basic shape. The success of the Metro Cab sent car bodies back to the drawing board. We decided not to change the exterior of the cab, basically because it was a world-famous vehicle. I think people coming into London, for instance, can, can easily recognise that it's a taxi, and when hailing a taxi, you straight away look for this particular shape. Car bodies turn the necessity of keeping the old body into a virtue. They also realised that drivers were more interested in the interior, so they replaced the austere dashboard with new controls, more like a modern car. The rear seat was quite a nice example of, of a component designed specially for the taxi. When you consider that people maybe at 2 o'clock in the morning are not feeling too well, and uh, maybe might deposit something on the seat that you don't want. You've got to consider the easy clean uh, aspect of, of the seat itself. So with the uh, PVC manufacturers, we developed a seat that was PVC and non-porous, but also looked like velour. So you've got the aesthetic appeal of a nice velour material with the practical aspects of a PVC. This vehicle you're looking at now is the Fairway Gold. Um, top of the range model. 
you'll find that the driver today is having to do an enormous amount of time in the vehicle. Recession has hit everybody, especially the cab trade. And this, and this particular man, we have a fond name from we call them the Gucci cab drivers. They like the top of the range model. Um, if I show you inside the vehicle, you have velour panels, capping pieces, as you can see inside. You've got carpets, you've got velour seats, he's got electric windows. And I believe that the passenger who gets in it, he notes now, and I think that sometimes looks after the driver a bit better than he would normally do. This vehicle you're looking at is around 21,000 pounds, which is a hell of a lot of money for a vehicle. But then they get a hell of a lot of vehicle. It's your home for the day. So why not have a bit of comfort? The Metro Cab had left the FX4 behind in terms of performance. So car bodies went shopping for a new engine, overseas, to Nissan in Japan. There was, of course, concern of putting a, a, a Japanese engine into something as British as the London taxi. Um, but I think it was swiftly overcome by the commercial realities of life. And the commercial realities are that you have to build a product that the customer wants to buy. Otherwise, you won't have a British product. Over a period of time, it's actually become a classic. And people now relate to it as being the good old friendly London cab. They give London character. They're an institution. We are still repairing 15, 16 year old vehicles. The drivers who own those vehicles, they don't think they should be scrapped. What should happen to the FX4? Consign it to uh, the British Museum. Oh my goodness, I mean, even as we just go by the Tower of London, I think scrapping the London taxi uh, to, I think, to Londoners and to uh, tourists and Americans abroad, when they come here would say that's as fatal as taking away the Beefeaters costume from the uh, London Tower Beefeaters. I just hope they never take away the London taxi as it is today. I think we warm to round shapes because our eyes are round. We see round faces. We like round objects. Children like balloons. They're round. You don't see, well, you don't often see square balloons. But I think that a lot of it has to do with my theory, eye shape. Things are round. Television, although they're square in shape, the actual tube is round. And I think that's got an awful lot to do with it.